How's it going everyone? It's Sam. Michael Saylor just gave a new speech. He's talking about Bitcoin in a way he's never talked about it before. And he says this is not the same speech that he's given in the past. So I want to explain, or I actually just want to show you the video. It's it's really good. It's about 51 minutes long. He posted it on his Twitter. So I'm just going to record it and play it for you guys. Of course, you know, there are links underneath the video to Marjex in case you want to trade cryptocurrencies on leverage. There's also a link down there to CoinW as well. This is a bullish time in the market. And this is typically one of the, be one of the best times to trade cryptocurrency on leverage. So if you want to check those out, there are links underneath the video. But let's get right into the speech. Thank you, everybody for showing up. So do we want a little sailor chant? Sailor, sailor, sailor. Well, thank you for coming. Happy to be in Madeira. Um, so I was delighted I got a chance to speak but I was terrified because I knew that this crowd would already know everything I'd already said. And I'd have to come up with something new to say. So I'm going to put your fears to rest. I'm not going to talk about uh, all the things. I, I'm not going to recite the Breedlove Sailors series verbatim. And we're not going to do the four hour Lex podcast. I actually put together a new presentation today, and uh, this is my first time that I'm presenting it. I was asked to talk about how Bitcoin's gonna impact corporations and individuals, and I get asked a lot about how do governments perceive Bitcoin, and, and uh, I've, I've spent, um, you know, I spent a lot of my time uh, dealing with corporations, talking to executives, uh, talking to institutional investors, talking to politicians, reading thousands and thousands of pages of government filings. I'm the kind of guy that I will listen to every minute of congressional testimony just so I know what each of the 40 congressmen said or thought. Uh, admittedly, I'll do it on a, a speed listen, but I will listen because I want to know what they thought. And um, so what I prepared today is kind of amalgam of my views on this and I think um, I think this is the perfect audience presented to after after I finish I'm sure I'll get a chance to meet some of you and I'll look forward to getting your feedback so I'm going to start with a simple observation I think we all understand to survive everyone everyone must convert their work into assets that are scarce desirable portable durable and maintainable. If you're a living creature, you're, you're converting your work into organic energy. We call it fat. Fat's the most scarce, desirable, portable, durable, maintainable asset in the organic world. It might have been demonized, but if you can't generate fat, you're a type one diabetic. Life is gonna be short and brutal and difficult. You really need to be able to store energy. Now, if you're an individual, a company, a family, a government, you have the same exact challenge. Now we all know Bitcoin is the best asset. You agree? And there, there is no second best asset. And that is why we are here, right? Because we need an asset, Bitcoin is the best, there is no second best. But why is that the case? Well, let's just start with Bitcoin is digital. And the entire world for the last 5,000 years has lived on analog assets. Real estate, gold, silver, paper, money, bonds, buildings, collectibles, sports teams, livestock, cattle, and bales of tobacco, seashells, and glass beads. Now we have a digital asset. In fact, this is the digital asset. Maybe this is the only digital asset. Now, what is that? What kind of asset is it? Well, you could think of it as digital capital. And I've, you know, we've, we've talked about capitalism. There are hundreds of trillions of dollars of capital. Bitcoin is digital capital. 
You could also call it property. We have hundreds of trillions of dollars of property in the world. Bitcoin is digital property, something you can own. We could also call it wealth. Bitcoin is digital wealth. Analog wealth is when you own hundreds of acres of land somewhere. We can also call it digital money. Money, a medium of exchange, a store of value, a unit of account. But as you see, sometimes when people get wrapped, when they, when they get focused on money, they immediately go to medium exchange and they immediately think about a currency and they immediately get themselves wrapped around the axle in opposition to the peso or the dollar or the naira. And it becomes a very political discussion. When you come back to think of it as property or wealth, then it becomes much less political. And of course, my favorite, Bitcoin is digital energy. Now, fat is organic energy. The universe is made up of energy. Matter is static energy. Einstein showed us that when he gave us the E equals MC squared. He said matter is energy, energy is matter. Now, Bitcoin is more than these things. I could, I could go on for a while, but the point of this is not to talk to you about what Bitcoin is. You already know what Bitcoin means to you. The real point of this discussion is to talk about what Bitcoin means to the rest of the world. Bitcoin's going to have many types of participants in the future. You know, one set of participants, one set of people that are gonna be plugged into the Bitcoin network are clearly individuals. There are 8 billion individuals on the planet. What are the individuals going to contribute to the Bitcoin network? Right, the individuals bring creativity, they bring clarity, they bring conviction, they bring capability, they bring the conscience of the, to the world. And of course, they are going to hodl. They're going to hold Bitcoin for life, right? Now, how many? Lots, right? Right now, there are hundreds of millions of individuals that have an interest in Bitcoin one way, shape or the other. It's going to be billions. It's going to continue to grow. And a lot of times, a lot of our education is really focused on the individual. But I think that, I think that we can't stop with the individual because these individuals form groups, families, corporations, governments. They perform nonprofits. They form clubs, churches. There are a lot of ways that individual, individual creativity and aspiration manifest itself. And of course, one of my favorites is families. There's a billion families, billion, about a billion families, and why do families matter? They're the future of humanity. That's why they matter, right? Families bring the compassion, they bring the community, they bring continuity, they bring joy, they bring hope. And, if, and a family is, is a, just a much more powerful unit than just an individual. Families will hold. And we start, we're starting to think about families now and how they join the network. But there's a third organization Third type of group, an investment company. This is a, this is an, a set of organizations have not been involved in Bitcoin much uh, for the first 15 years of its existence. But investment companies can be, um, they can be mutual funds, they can be trust funds, they can be exchange traded funds, these ETFs, they can be hedge funds. And they have not trillions, but probably hundred trillion dollars worth of assets floating out there. And they get to decide how those assets will be disposed of and how they'll be situated. And they are actually acting on behalf of families and on behalf of individuals. So on one hand, you can't write them off when they can decide to, uh, to reallocate $10 billion from gold to Bitcoin on behalf of 18 million retirees that used to work for the postal service, right? And when they make that decision, they're making that decision that impacts families and impacts individuals, but they're also making the decision as a fiduciary. And the last 36 days have been an illustration of how important these kind of companies are because every day in the market, they're buying hundreds of millions of dollars of Bitcoin. They're trading it and they're building up billion dollar positions. This has just started. We're 36 days into a massive adoption of just these exchange traded funds, but it's going to just keep going. And they're going to ripple all through the world, through all sorts of economies. 
and they will have a, a profound impact, and, and in my opinion, a profound impact for good. Uh, it used to be, if you go back to 2018 in the Bitcoin community, if you said the word, you said Larry Fink, people go, they would say, oh, Larry Fink doesn't like us. And uh, in the year 2024, Larry Fink goes on television and speaks to leaders in the world and says Bitcoin is a store of value. It, it protects the sovereignty of the individual. It allows, it allows you to achieve your hopes. It is hope. Larry Fink has said Bitcoin is hope. Now, what, is that, what does that say to me? It says, we don't have enemies. What we have are people that need Bitcoin that don't yet know why they should be our friend. When someone goes on television and they're asked, what do you think about Bitcoin? And they get poked and they're a little bit irritated. They got to ask the question. They're not an enemy of Bitcoin. They're just not prepared for the question. And in fact, over time, the journalist will do the poking because they know the most important thing in the world today is Bitcoin. And you're gonna have a group of people that understand it, that will say it's the future. And you'll have a, a group of people that don't understand it and they will not have embraced it. But it, at the end of the day, with time, with education, we're going, to, we're going to see more and more people join the network and they're gonna participate. Now, those investment companies aren't the only type of companies. There are operating companies. And, uh, and operating, co by the way, how many? If you do a quick Google search, 333 million is the count on Google of companies in the world. Think about that for a second, 333 million. There's a lot of companies and, and, and all of these individuals and all of these families they all act through corporate entities. Oftentimes, you'll see a group of five or six or 10 or 50 or 500 or 5,000 or 50,000. Now, how important are companies? Well, they provide all the products, all the services. They develop technology. Not many people in the room can create their own iPhone. You know, not many people in the room want to manufacture and, and ship all their food or grow their own fruit in the winter. These companies are critical to our quality of life. We know that from Austrian economics. But if you're wondering, like, how long have we had specialization of labor? You know, one, one million years ago, they dug up stone axe factories. And it indicates that a million years ago, before we had writing, before there was recorded history, there was a company manufacturing stone axes, which meant that there was a specialized economy with corporations. But there are people growing food, there are people hunting, there are people fighting, there are probably people collecting the taxes to pay for the stone axes, for the people fighting. It's, it's all happened before. And, uh, and today, companies like Apple and Google and Microsoft perform pretty systemically important roles, as does the airline that flew you here as does the contractor that built the stadium or built the bridges or the tunnels or the airports you landed on. These are important. What are they gonna to bring to Bitcoin? Well, they're gonna bring new services, like Cash App as a service. They're gonna bring new products. They're gonna bring your, your signing devices. They're gonna bring you full nodes or integrated nodes or, or, or the like. They're gonna bring new technology. One day, I believe Apple, Microsoft, Google, they will all integrate Bitcoin and layer two protocols like Lightning into their phones, into their computers, into their web services, into their cloud services. They're gonna bring cool applications. You know, every single Bitcoin wallet, Lightning wallet is a cool application. It, they were all made by a corporation. They're gonna provide support and and maybe importantly, they provide credibility, right? Companies have credibility with the people. When, when, uh, when a large corporation offers something to a billion people over the weekend, you get 437 million downloads, right? An individual can't get 437 million people to do anything over the weekend. When, uh, when a company has a problem, they pick up the phone, they call the White House, or they call a senator, or they call a congressman, or they go to court and they sue. 
Companies actually can avail themselves of the legal system, the political system, the executive branch. You know, sometimes they're in um, controversies, but companies have credibility, and that credibility will defend the network, it will spread the network, it will enhance the network, it will, uh, it will actually embrace or en enhance and support the lives of every individual and every family. We need them, right? Companies are, companies are not, you know, the evil empire creature that's against you. Companies are just made up of people. And the person running the company either understands Bitcoin or they don't. And if they don't, then they're just a, a supporter waiting to be recruited. Or there'll be someone that understands it, you know, and, and they own it personally, and they're waiting for the political environment and their company to change so that they can buy it corporately. You know, Tim Cook has, has uh, admitted to, you know, owning Bitcoin, right? Lots of senior level CEOs own it. Sometimes they're reacting to their shareholders, their board of directors, their employees, their regulators, and privately, individually, they would pursue one, one uh, agenda, but publicly because they have to uh, report or they have to represent the corporate interests and they have to respect the constituencies they serve, like the customers that don't understand it, they have to wait until their customers understand it or demand it before they can move. But ultimately, these operating companies are going to be great supporters of the network. They already are, and they will hodl. They're going to build Bitcoin on their balance sheets in the same way. Now we get to everybody's favorite, banks, right? And you can be your own bank. That's the promise of Bitcoin. But, you know, there are thousands if not tens or hundreds of thousands of banks in the world and they're serving they're serving you know who knows how many people you know billions and billions of people and they're custodying hundreds of trillions of dollars of assets and they are intertwined essentially in the fabric of the economy and Bitcoin offers them something too. It offers them the same benefits and many of the benefits it offers a family and individual corporation. But what do they do? Well, they, they custody, they extend credit, they'll give you a loan, they, make sure that they deal with compliance rules. How many different sets of rules are there in the world? There's 10,000 jurisdictions, 10,000 different sets of rules. And the banks have armies of lawyers and accountants and compliance people to figure out how to give you a mortgage or to figure out how to give you a car loan, right? It's a lot of work. You know, you don't really want to borrow money from the dude down the street, right? They call that a loan shark. And yes, you can do it, but the interest rate, you know, is going to run to 70% a year, not 7% a year. So however bad you think it is with a bank, it gets infinitely worse when it's an individual, right? And uh, they don't sue you. They break your legs when you don't pay the bill. So banks are really important for these things. They also have an important role in transfer, settlement, moving, moving assets around millions of times a day or billions of times a day. <clears throat> and ultimately, you know, they used to joke banks where all the money are, where all the money is. Banks will hold it. Banks will also hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet in time. As will nonprofits, right? How important are nonprofits? Your church, your school, right? Your, your soccer team or your clubs, right? The garden club, the pet club, the horse association, the Olympics. Every possible nonprofit, every activist group, you, you know that almost 6% of the U.S. economy is nonprofits? I mean, it's, a prof it's an incredible amount, right? And so what, it, what can they contribute? Well, they educate, they empower, they will expand the Bitcoin network throughout the world. They'll go places that, you know, maybe you don't want to go and they will go, right? Uh, they will drive engagement. Right, that they have missions to engage with the weak, the young, the old, the poor. I mean, everybody everywhere over the border where you are not, 
They go into dangerous war zones. They're the Red Cross, right? They provide medical services, right? And they provide advocacy. They're pretty effective at providing advocacy. When they're on your side, they spread ideas all through the world. And when they're against you, they can also be not so good. And they're endowed, right? The greatest endowments of the world, the Harvard, the Yale endowments, right? Uh, these institutions like Cambridge or Oxford, they've been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. That's because they have endowments. Bitcoin is the best, the best asset in the endowment, right? This is a solution to them and this is a need they have. And, and we will see more and more of them embrace this. And then finally, I, I, I could subdivide the world into 37 categories, but I'm gonna end with governments because oftentimes people think, well, the government is against Bitcoin. And what I'm here to say is the government is made up of people and the government's here to provide essential services everywhere on earth to deal with, with defense, water, sewer, education, medicine, insurance, social security, for the young, for the old, for the orphans. There's a lot of things governments do, including keeping traffic working and keeping the ports working. And so how do they integrate, how, what can they bring to the Bitcoin network? Education. We're actually here in Madeira at the end. The only reason I'm here is I was invited here by the president of Madeira. And so they have this role, they, they will integrate, they will provide security. I think governments will, will eventually engage in Bitcoin mining, they will support Bitcoin miners, they will defend Bitcoin miners. When you see a world of 100 different countries, all of them mining Bitcoin, then an attack on one of the, of the Bitcoin miners may result in a response by another country. So I think the governments will also be advocates and the governments have balance sheets and the governments will hold them. So everybody here, they all need Bitcoin. They can all contribute to Bitcoin. And they will all support it. So key point, everybody. And when I say everyone, I don't mean every person. I mean every entity. Every, the ones you love, the ones you hate, your enemies, your friends, the company you dislike, the company that you adore, the other family, the whatever. The, your favorite sports team and the awful soccer team that beat your soccer team. You saw an awful football team that beat your football team. <laughs> it's not just Bedford that needs Bitcoin. Um, everybody benefits from Bitcoin. They might not know it, but they do benefit. Why do they benefit? Because, because the story of civilization is about purging toxicity from our systems, right? Humans started living longer when we realized we shouldn't drink water with germs in it. And then we realized we, why we cook our food to get the toxic germs out of the food, right? And then at some point we realized that if we could get the toxic pathogens out of our blood, we might live longer. Antibiotics are about getting the toxins out of your blood, right? Sterilization, boiling water is about getting the toxins out of the water. Cooking food is about getting the toxins out of the food. We've lived with toxic money for 5,000 years. The money is simply the economic energy coursing through every government, every corporation, every group, every family, every individual. When it's, when it's moving through your P&L, right, and it's toxic, it's undermining your performance, but when you store it in your treasury, right, then it's actually just undermining your life expectancy. So toxicity is holding us back. In 1900, the average life expectancy was 50. By 1950, it was 70. That was the conquest of infectious disease. Another way to say it was overcoming Tox, toxic pathogens, and we did it with a combination of sterilization, modern medicine, antibiotics, okay? Everybody wants to live longer. Even the people you disagree with, even the people with missions you don't agree with, they all want to achieve more of it, and they all want to achieve more of it by not being held back by toxicity. So 
Everyone needs it, everyone benefits from it, but the most important point is everyone benefits Bitcoin, right? When the, when the bank that you hate starts to custody Bitcoin, well, that just means that the Bitcoin that you self-custody became worth 10 times as much, right? That these ETFs that have bought up 1% of the supply of Bitcoin, well, they have conveyed 100x as much benefit to the people that don't believe in ETFs, right? It's $400 billion dividend to people that don't like ETFs. They're not hurting you. What happens is when your enemy joins, you get, you're improved and the network is improved and the likelihood of war decreases. We, we move, if we want to eliminate war and conflict and violence, we really want all of our enemies to settle their differences in a fair, equitable fashion. And the fair, equitable, peaceful way to settle your differences is Bitcoin. So you shouldn't fear those who don't understand who are your enemy who join Bitcoin, you should fear those who are your enemies that don't join Bitcoin. They're the ones that will use bullets to solve the problem. So let's get to the happy part. How are individuals gonna benefit from Bitcoin? Well, what, is, what does Bitcoin bring you, right? I mean, it empowers everyone to live their best possible life, right? It's bringing you freedom, economic freedom, political freedom. You go where you want. You, ha you have control of your destiny. It's not that different that, you know, for people that fast, we've discovered that you don't got to eat for three or four days. And when you realize you don't have to eat for five days at a time, that's pretty empowering. Like I can go through an airport without stopping to eat. It's pretty amazing. Well, imagine being able to go where you want to go. It, it opens up opportunity for you. It provides you with emotional security, mental security, physical security, economic security. It provides camaraderie. I mean, look at us all here today. I have something in common with every one of you. And it's just awesome. I invite you all to think about your relationships and the nature of your relationships before you discovered Bitcoin. And then think about how they changed after you discovered Bitcoin, right? I, I just see it as like, it's like coming out, out of the darkness into the light. And, that, and that's why I see Bitcoin as empowerment and hope for the individual. But for the family, what does it mean to the family? It is a foundation to support your family for generations, right? What, what is the tragedy of the family? The tragedy of a family is when you run your family on toxic money and you build your family on defective assets and defective property. I'll give you a classic cliche tragedy. Our family came to this country my great-grandfather bought this farm, my grandfather farmed this land, my father farmed this land, now I can't pay the taxes on it, we gotta sell it and all move into like apartments. Why? Because property is a defective way. It was the best idea 200 years ago, I get it, but if you actually own a thousand acres and then someone comes in and creates a state and a mayor gets elected and the mayor decides to spend lots of money on whatever, and they raise your taxes and raise them again and raise them a third time, pretty soon the people with the farm can't pay the taxes and then the government decides that you're the bad guy, they take all your land and eject you or evict you, you know? And maybe they don't do it directly, maybe first you mortgage the farm and then you can't pay the mortgage and then the bank seizes your property. And that's a tragedy, and what is the tragedy? The tragedy is, you built your family on a defective asset. You need a, and a defective money. Not your fault. I mean, look, you go back a million years, people are dying at age 28. They have no antibiotics. We didn't know that sugar was toxic. Our teeth fell out. We didn't know how to, how to deal with a pneumonia infection. You get cut, you die. You know, someone drinks water, it kills them. You eat the wrong food. You get dysentery, you get cholera. No, you know, whatever. 
the, the history of humanity is people dying and suffering because of toxicity. And the promise of technology is first we come up with the science to figure out it's toxic, right? The microscope let us look into the blood and realize that there were bacteria that were killing us, right? You need the instrument, then you need the understanding, then you solve the problem, right? That is the story of civilization. That, that is how humans progress. Well, with families, a lot of families struggle and, and the economic struggle is a defective economic strategy. Bitcoin gives you that foundation. And you can use it to protect your family, relocate anywhere, change your career, create a legacy, accumulate more assets, accumulate wealth, plan for the future. You know, if you asked me, if before Bitcoin, if you asked me, how are you gonna, how are you gonna create or, or fund your foundation for the next 100 years? I would have said something like, I guess I give all my money to Wall Street and I hire some good money managers. And 70 years from now, the grandson of someone that I hired today might go to college, figure out what to do and, and day trade or shuffle my money around so I don't lose it. May I, that's the best idea. It's not a good idea, right? Right. That's how the Rockefellers do it, right? But, but you know, the, what you'll see is that 100 years after someone actually accumulates some wealth, the, the money's generally gone 99% of the time. And what Bitcoin offers the family is the ability to actually plan for your great granddaughter and think that maybe there'll be some support for them and uh, no one is gonna take it from them. One of, those op one of those investment companies need Bitcoin, right? They need Bitcoin to attract capital. You see it happening, $600 million flowing into BlackRock yesterday, $10 billion in a month. Right? If you look at the ETFs, what you'll see is that the Bitcoin ETFs are crawling up past all the commodities. They're about to eat the gold ETFs, and then they're going to eat the S&P 500 index ETFs. And when that happens, everybody's going to take note. Vanguard is going to take note. Right? That, the world is going to change. You can't attract capital without Bitcoin and you can't outperform. Bitcoin is going to outperform the S&P and gold and bonds. And, and as it outperforms, everyone who's indifferent and objective, who doesn't know what it is and doesn't care, right? They're going to just say, move more of my money over here because the world's full of people that would just like to not lose their money, right? And, uh, and so what we're gonna see is investment companies need this to outperform and that's gonna result in them generating income and that results in them staying relevant, right? I mean, how many people are bragging about their, you know, new gold ETF, right? It's not relevant. It's not relevant. Um, you want to be a leader, right? The people that we, that we look to are the people that, were, that, that discovered or, or created Google and Apple and Microsoft, and they create the next airplane, and you know they, they put Starlink in the sky, and they give us internet, and they give us the next phone, right? Be relevant. Be a leader. These companies want to be leaders. Right? You won't find a CEO that says, my aspiration is to be viewed as, as a follower and late to the next great thing. And they all want to create shareholder value, right? You can't create shareholder value by shrinking. And so that takes us to operating companies. It's the same thing. But operating companies, for the most part in the world, are like type 1 diabetics. I, I had a hundred competitors over 20 years. They all failed. There's a 99% mortality rate with these companies, right? You look at the number and you're like, well, I don't know 300 million companies. That's because they're failing millions every single month. They're all failing all the time. 
Why are they failing? They can't store energy. They can't harness capital, right? What does Facebook do? They give all their capital back to the shareholders in a dividend and a buyback. What does Apple do? They give their capital back in a dividend and a buyback. They take on debt. How do companies fail? They leverage up, they take on debt. What happens when you take on debt? Well, instead, I used to say to people, well, we have 500 million in capital. We could go for 40 quarters. We'd go for 10 years and not make any money and we'll still be in business. It's like you could go for 10 years and not eat and still be alive. That's indestructible. On the other hand, when you give all the money back and you borrow a billion dollars, well, in that case, you end up with a debt covenant and you have to generate $27 million this quarter. And if you generate $26 million this quarter, if you miss by one, one one thousandth of your capital structure, if you miss by 0.1%, you actually trip all the debt covenants and the bank owns you. You're technically, you're technically in violation of your, of your debt. They can call the loan, you're insolvent. So think about the difference between you starving to death if you miss one meal versus you starving to death when you haven't eaten for the year. Okay, that's the difference between having capital and having no capital. The status quo in the world today is we tell people you can't keep capital in an operating company because all of the uses, all the, the liquid capital is dilutive and it doesn't beat the cost of capital. Bitcoin solves the problem. You can harness capital, you can improve your products, you can grow your revenues, you can beat inflation for the first time. You know, there's, the Magnificent Seven are good investments, the other 493 companies are not, because the other 493 companies cannot beat inflation. Because beating inflation means raising, increasing your cash flow 8% every year forever or more like raising your prices 10% a year forever. Who can do that? A digital monopoly, a company with no cost, with monopoly pricing power. How many of them are there in the world? Like, there's like one in 10,000 companies that you would know of and one in 1,000 public companies. Okay, so these companies, the ones that you might be afraid of, they're not winning. Right, they're struggling in the same way and Bitcoin is a lifeline for them that you could think of them as wage slaves in the same way that you are a wage slave. Everybody is working, having to get 10% more every year just to keep ahead of inflation. It's just theirs is in revenue and cash flow. And so what does Bitcoin offer them? Extended lifespan. You see a CEO and you say, well, are you gonna adopt Bitcoin? He says, why should I? I say, well, it might keep your company from going bankrupt in 10 years. It might, it might allow you to continue to do business and serve your customers for the next 100 years. How many companies are 100 years old? Not many. I'll ask you another question. How many famous education institutions with endowments are 100 years old? Most of them, right? Why is it that, that universities last 100 years and companies don't? No capital, that's why. You think anybody goes in business wanting to die? That you think they want to have their company fail in 12 years or six years or 25 years? No, they're stuck in a system, right? They're stuck in a traditional system that makes them do this. Banks have the same issue. They wanna attract and retain capital. They wanna decrease risk. You know, you could say, well, you know, the bank is beholden the central bank. Well, here's another vision. What about 100,000 banks that are all tapped into the Bitcoin network and they don't have to worry about the Bitcoin network shutting them down, right? When a bank joins Bitcoin, it becomes systemically robust, much more anti-fragile. This is a benefit to banks, right? They'd like to find a way to do this. This will decrease their risk, increase their earnings, let them create shareholder value, let them delight their clients. They have a billion customers, they have corporations, they need to serve them. All of these companies, all of these nonprofits, they all need the bank to support what they do, right? And in time they will. The nonprofits are also gonna benefit, they wanna raise capital, but also they have endowments. They want their endowments to go up 40% a year, not go up 4% a year, 
right? There's nobody running a church, a charity, a benefit, a school that'll say, we don't want our endowment to appreciate and we don't want an endowment. This allows them to harness technology. This allows them to extend their reach globally. You know, Bitcoin is money that's global and it's got a half-life of forever. All of these, all of these endowments, they're using money that has a half-life of 10 years or five years. Your property might have a half-life of 20 years. Their investments are short duration and their investments are local, right? Their property is local. So Bitcoin stretches your scope across time and space. Now tell me what charitable pursuit doesn't want to do more and last forever. They all do, right? You won't find anyone that, that says, well, we just want to be out of business in three years. So Bitcoin's the solution to nonprofits. And for governments, traditionally people have thought, you know, well, the government doesn't like or won't embrace Bitcoin, but you know, they will embrace Bitcoin because Bitcoin provides them with the financial power to thrive in the 21st century. And there's no, there's no government on earth that doesn't appreciate the power of money, right? This will allow them to lower taxes. It will allow them to strengthen their currencies, defend their sovereignty, improve their economies, join the global community and delight their citizens. And, and if you talk to any politician, there's none of them that will say these aren't agenda items for them. And if you say, well, could you achieve that with infinite money? And say, well, I don't know if I could achieve it, but it'll make it a lot easier, right? And if you said, well, how about if I just took all your money away from you in five years, would that make it easier or harder? And the answer is, it would make it somewhere between hard and impossible. So now I get to the important part of my talk. This is where you come in. Ask not what Bitcoin can do for you, ask what you can do for Bitcoin. Bitcoin needs you. That's the reason, if you're wondering why you're here, you're here because Bitcoin needs you. And, and my deepest hope is when you leave, you'll leave empowered, inspired, and enabled to go do good for Bitcoin wherever you go back to after you leave Madeira. <clears throat> I can't stress this enough. Everyone you encounter is an opportunity to improve the world by gaining their support for Bitcoin. Your customers, your employees, your boss, your investors, your clients, the mayor, the, the coach on the team, the parents at the, at the PTA meeting, the teachers of your kids, the doctor at the hospital, your dentist, everybody you run into is an opportunity. And what we can do collectively that'll make the biggest difference is spread to people, right? The knowledge of Bitcoin is that if you knew that drinking dirty water would kill you, you would tell people you love to stop drinking it. If you knew antibiotics could save their life, you would tell them about your experience. When it comes to this, and we, we, I've got the orange pill here, and we talk about orange pilling, but, but I break it down in, uh, in two different cycles, right? First of all, everybody you meet has an intellectual perspective on Bitcoin. Okay, and they're going to click through these five gears. The first perspective is denier. Bitcoin is a scam. It's tulip bulbs. It doesn't exist. It's a ghost, a mirage, a pyramid scheme. And if we convince them that, you know, I would show them a picture of all the Bitcoin miners in the world and say, oh, you look, there's like hundreds and hundreds of data centers burning more gigawatts of electricity than the U.S. Navy. This is not a scam. This is the most powerful computer network in the world. And we want to get them from denier to skeptic. The skeptic is, okay, I get it. Bitcoin may be a good thing, but it's too good to be true. The government's going to ban it. You hear that a lot. Okay, 
It's good, I get it, but someone's going to take it away from you, the skeptic. And what you have to then show is, well, if the government was going to ban it, they wouldn't be bragging about having captured $3 billion of it and selling it in the open market, right? Nor would they have approved the ETFs, nor would they be fighting over who gets jurisdiction over it, right? And we need to move people from denier to skeptic. And then the next step, we take them to trader. Okay, well, maybe I guess I might buy some, but I'll probably sell it. I don't, you know, I'll buy it if it's going up. I'll sell it if I think it's going down. I don't have an opinion, but look, that's a step up. And then hopefully they get to that next level investor. Bitcoin is great technology, just like Google, just like Apple, just like Microsoft, just like water, electricity, cars, and planes are great technology. It's technology, it's the future. I should invest in it. You made a lot of money on the Magnificent Seven. How do you not own Bitcoin? Do you not believe in the Magnificent Seven? You think semiconductors won't make a difference? You don't believe in artificial intelligence? They have the same cycles, by the way. Once we get them to invest, or the last step intellectually is Bitcoin is an instrument of economic empowerment. And if Jack Dorsey's here, I give him a shout out. Jack Dorsey put that in my head. By the way, don't get, don't get dejected that someone may actually be a denier. You know who was a denier? Me. And you know what I became next? A skeptic. And then at some point, I looked and I said, you know, the world's kind of messed up and interest rates are zero and my dollars are generating zero. I'm going to buy Bitcoin and I became a trader. And then after I bought the Bitcoin, I started reading a lot more and listening to a lot more podcasts and thought about it. And I realized, no, I should be an investor. You know, and I, I would say when I got in the, when you started hearing about me, I was kind of at the investor stage, but it was everybody in this community and every, every Bitcoin podcaster and every writer and every educator that collectively got me over the line to becoming a maximalist, where I said, <laughs> So, yeah, if you don't think you make a difference, you do make a difference, right? You're never going to see a collection of people like this at, a, at an Apple investor conference or at a Google investor or Microsoft investor or NVIDIA investor conference or gold investor conference. This is very special. I like the orange. I'll marry the orange. Um, when you're orange pilling, right, you're working people intellectually, but there's also spiritual. And they all start as observers. It's all the people writing about Bitcoin on Twitter and they observe it, but they don't own any. And then they become participants and then they start to actually buy and build on it. And maybe they own like 1%. And then the believers say, wait a minute, this really is the best asset and maybe 40% of my portfolio is liquid and my rest of my wealth is in my house. And so they go and they start to put a bunch of their liquid wealth into Bitcoin because they're believers. And then at some point you get to be hardcore and I'll call you an adherent. And then you're like all in. It's like the only thing I want to invest in is Bitcoin. You know, I'm not saying you got to sell all your chairs, just the ones you don't need. But this is a spiritual journey and then and then at the final point you become an advocate and when you're an advocate it's not just you're all in you want to go tell other people you want to convince your company your charity your church your government your friends your family you're an advocate so think of this as a as a continuum and we're working together to move people from the lower left quadrant you know denier observer and they're going to say, well, don't talk to me about Bitcoin. They know about it, but they don't want to talk about it. And you move to the upper right quadrant. You know, you're a maximalist and you're an advocate. And, uh, you know, and, and you don't necessarily just stay there. We all got to work together to keep ourselves motivated to be in that quadrant because it can be uh, quite a drain. 
But I, but I just leave you with this thought, right? Which is Bitcoin grows stronger with every new participant at any level, right? It, you know, you can say whatever you want about me, just spell the name right, right? Say the name right, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, right? When, when people are talking crap about Bitcoin, we're winning. When they're not sure about Bitcoin, we're winning. When they're liking it, we're winning. When they're debating something, we're winning, right? Bitcoin grows stronger. And um, I posted this yesterday. It's like Bitcoin represents the digital transformation of capital. What is that worth? That is worth half of everything in the human race. It's half of everything. There's other stuff, medicine, politics, education. I don't dismiss it, but the digital transformation of capital and energy and property means that every person, every family, every corporation, every government, every movement can live their best life, achieve their greatest aspirations, right? And, and when you think about that Olympic athlete and you walk in the room and you say, hey, guess what? The new science came in. We don't have to bleed you this week. You know, you get to keep your blood while you're working out, you know, and, and we're not going to cut off your oxygen, right? At that point, you think maybe you got a chance to win this thing. And so I want to thank everybody and just end with the observation. Bitcoin's for everyone.